going to look at uh, 1 verse 3. And also Galatians 5, we'll look at 1 verse there also. So Luke 11 and Galatians chapter 5. So in Luke chapter 11, let's uh, look in verse, uh, verse 34. Luke 11 verse 34, uh, which reads, The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, the whole body is also, sorry, also is full of light. But when thine, when thine eye is evil, thy body also is full of darkness. In Galatians 5 verse 17, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your, your grace, your mercy. Thank you once again for the absolute blessing that we can just gather here together today in, in, uh, in freedom. And Lord, we just do, again, I Lord, never stop saying thank you for, for the blessings that you've given to us. Oh, Lord, how we ought to be so thankful for what you've done. And uh, Lord, I just do I pray as we open your word this afternoon that you would lead and guide uh, in your word. May the Holy Spirit of God just speak to our hearts. And, and Father, I thank you for what you'll do. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so uh, uh, I'm starting off again where we finished this morning in the sense of, uh, I just want to say that uh, our body may be the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, but our mind is the front door of the temple. And uh, what enters the front door of the temple each day is what your temple will be attracted to. But, you know, those two verses there reflect that. Uh, the light of the body is the eye, and, and of course what goes in through here gets processed up here in the, in the, in the mind. And, uh, and we have an almighty, when well, it's not the right things, we have an almighty struggle with the flesh, don't we? The flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And uh, let me just say this, if the door is open, the devil will always oblige and accept the, invit the invitation and fill the mind which will affect the temple. He's never backward to do that. Uh, for that which the mind accepts is what the temple or body will do. And, uh, you know, Paul, what did Paul say to himself? He said, uh, Romans 7 verse 15, he said, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. And uh, yeah, that doesn't mean that Paul was running around committing gross sin. But it just shows the depths of, of our old nature. I mean, Paul was someone that loved the Lord passionately, served the Lord passionately, uh, the Lord had his whole heart. And, uh, and you know his life was obviously an example of of a Christ-like life, uh, and yet Paul could honestly say that which I uh, that will, but what I hate that do I. And uh, he goes on down there further on Romans seven verse twenty five. He said um, about uh, how to get the victory. He said, "I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord." So then, with the mind. I myself served the law of God. That's talk, Paul talking about himself, where he was at. But with the flesh, uh, the law of sin. And so uh, he's describing the battle that he's, that he's written about in Galatians 5 also. Uh, you know, Paul had learned to cast down the imaginations. He had he learned to, to uh, take into captivity every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ. And... Uh, and so he, he knew, when he wrote that there, and yes, it's under the inspiration of God, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. But when he wrote that in Romans 7, 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God. He's saying that uh, by the grace of God and through the working of the Holy Spirit of God in his life, uh, you know, he'd managed to, to get those things under control, um, even though he'd still be a sinner saved by the grace of God. So he had, by the power of God, been able to capture and cast down imaginations, to bring his thoughts into captivity. And, uh, you know, that is no small thing in our lives. It really is, it really is the big, the big battle. 
uh, because you're bringing it in, into, you're capt capturing into the obedience of Jesus Christ, your Lord, your Saviour, the one that saved you from your sins. So our body might be the temple of the Holy Spirit, but our mind is the front door of the temple. And what goes in is, is what we become. So a mind surrendered to the Lord is another, is another, another thought. A mind surrendered to the Lord is his fertile ground. Uh, what will it produce? If we, have a, if we have a surrendered mind, therefore a renewed mind, uh, then God has fertile ground to work on. And so I've got uh, a few points here which I don't know that I've got time to go through all this afternoon. But the first one is a desire to serve Him is what it will produce. Uh, Philippians 2 verse 5, we already know that, and Hebrews 12 verse 2. But uh, let's go to Acts chapter 20. And while you're turning to Acts 20, uh, I'll say the other two verses. Uh, Hebrews, sorry, uh, Philippians 2 5. Uh, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then uh, Hebrews 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so, if you think of those two verses, uh, Paul was the epitome of those two verses. He... Uh, he had a Christ-like mind. And you've only got to read through the gospel, uh, sorry, the uh, book of Acts and, and the epistles to the Gentile churches to see that. Uh, and then Hebrews 12, verse 2, uh, he obviously had been looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of, it, of his faith, uh, throughout his life. You couldn't endure what Paul had endured in serving God and not have a, a life that was dedicated to the Lord, that, that, a life that was uh, Christ-like, uh, where he had a mindset that was Christ-like, he couldn't have it uh, and, and not be looking under Jesus, the author and finisher of his faith, and do what he did. It was all by the power of God. And, and having, having a look in Acts chapter 20, we see Paul on the way to, to Jerusalem. Paul was on the way to Jerusalem to, he had a burden to, for his fellow Jews. He just couldn't contain himself anymore. He had to go in his own heart and mind. And off he went. And uh, looking in verse number uh, 23 there, it says uh, in Acts 20, 23, uh, this is the words of Paul on his way. He said, Say that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in, in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of those things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And so you think about that, here is Paul, he's been warned all the way along, and even to the point in Acts chapter 21, verse uh, 4, it says they're finding certain disciples uh, in Tyre, that was in verse 3, uh, and finding uh, disciples, we tarried there, sorry, yeah, we tarried the seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. And so, uh, you know, Paul is still of that same mind. None of these things move me. He had a surrendered mind. He had a surrendered life. Sorry, let me go back. He had a surrendered mind. He had a renewed mind because of that. And he had a surrendered life to serve the Lord. And he had that great desire and nothing could change that. And off he went. Brethren, let me say this. God wants every one of us to have a renewed mind because he has ways for all of us to serve him. And it doesn't mean we're all called to the ministry, not at all. But you know, you stop and you look back on, on, on lives. I fear we've lost something in this day and age in our Christianity, in our walk with the Lord, generally in, in churches. Um, we all know the name craft in the sense of craft cheeses and you know, all the craft products. The, uh, one of the originals, in fact, I think it was the original craft involved in craft foods. Multinational company these days. James Craft was a born again, Bible believing, Baptist Christian. And he said at one stage, 
he said he because he, he and he taught a Sunday school class for forty odd years. And he said one time he would rather be a servant in the in the Lord's work doing the Sunday school class than being a famous worldwide businessman. Words to that effect. It's not word for word, but that's what he was saying. He had that desire to serve. And that's really what God blessed him with. He used for the Lord's work as well. You know, uh, you know brother, in a mind surrendered to the Lord is his fertile ground. I, I always like, I love William Carey, the father of modern missions. He uh, went to India. And as far as a missionary goes, he had the foggiest idea what he was doing when he went. That's true. I'm not being mean about the guy. That's, that's, what, that's the way it was. He stumbled from one disaster to the next when he got to India. Was it God's will for him to go? Yes, it was. We can see the results thereof. But God allowed that. And he learned hard, hard lessons. They lost one of it. He and his wife lost a son early on, early on. His wife lost her health and she passed away. He remarried. But it was a hard journey. But you know, that hard journey that, that he experienced and the rest of his family experienced did not deter him from continuing to serve him all his life. Now, I, I read just something the other day, and I hope I can remember it fairly accurately, about William Carey when he was dying. I was, there was a, 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 another missionary went in to see him. He was on his deathbed pretty much. And William Carey's voice was very weak by this time, after many years of service in India. Many years of service, that, which by the way, he's still remembered for in India. A country that's, that, yeah, where Christians get persecuted now. Where a, a, a missionary, the Baptist Union, a missionary from, was down from the Lockyer Valley near Brisbane. He and his two sons got burned to death there a few number of years ago. Uh, I've, got the, I've got the movie, we can watch it on time. He still remembered. Why? Because of his great desire to serve God. But the thing is, on his deathbed, this other missionary went in and talked to him, and William Carey speaking in a really soft voice. And and I forget what the missionary said to him, but it was something to the effect of, you know, William Carey, the memory of William Carey will be, be remembered uh, off into the future for what, what God used you for. And he, and he, anyway, this guy was going out, and William Carey whispered to him, called out to him as loud as he could in his, in his low tones as he was near death, and he, and he called him back. And he said, no. He said, just remember, just, just tell him what Jesus Christ has done, what the Lord has done. And that's a true servant of God. He just had a desire to serve the Lord because he had a mind surrendered. Didn't know what he was doing when he got there. Things were pretty tough, pretty rough. Poverty, loss of life, as I've already described, and uh, and so forth. And but he went on because he had that surrendered mind, which gave him a renewed mind, and God used that. He gave him a great desire to serve Him. The second, the second result of having a mind surrendered to the Lord, making it His fertile ground. The second result is will have a sincere desire to have the Holy Spirit of God reprove us of God's right and just ways. Uh, John chapter 16. Look at John 16. John 16. Verses 8 and 10. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, this is the night He was betrayed. He, he was telling the disciples about the Holy Spirit coming in these chapters. And uh, in verse, chapter, John chapter 16, verse 8, sorry, talking of the Holy Spirit, he said, And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. But in verse 10, he says to, this, to, to the disciples and looks at them and says, Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. And so, you know, that's just as much for, the, for, the, for us as what it is for the world. The Holy Spirit of God is the one that reproves us, he, he, he convicts us, in other words, of, of what is right and wrong in our lives. And, you know, a, a mind that is, that is 
surrendered to God, that God is able to then renew. It, it becomes his fertile ground. And when you, when you get to that point in your life, you, let me just say this, and I'm being honest when I say this, you want God to show you what's wrong in your life. Why? Because you know that if you harbour those things in your life that should not be there, it is going to negatively affect your walk with the Lord. It is going to negatively affect your relationship with the Lord and you will not get to the deep fellowship and relationship with the Lord that He wants you to get. Have a look at Hebrews chapter 12. You know, we often go to Hebrews 12 and, and look at verses 1 and 2. But let's read on from there. Hebrews 12. We read verses 1 and 2, especially verse 2 about looking unto Jesus. And then look at just, we just, we'll just go through the verses. Oh, yeah, we won't read them right through, but just look at them. Verse 3 it says, For consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners. So it's talking of the Lord Jesus. Uh, verse 4, uh, Ye have not resisted under blood, uh, striving against sin. Verse 5, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you. This is the part we need to look at. Ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. Now take note, my son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he received. If you're born again, don't, don't resent when God has to chasten you. Don't, don't, don't despise it. Why? Because he loves you. And he's trying to help you. And he's trying to help you to have a victorious, happy life in the real life. Look, that, that, all that stuff out there, that's not the real life. That's temporal. And one day, everybody on this earth is going to step off into eternity and they're all going to be on the right side of God or they're going to be on the wrong side of God. And those that are on the wrong side will wish they never were. Not because God's a meanie. God loves them just as much as He loves you and I that are born again. But if they reject what the, Lord, the Lord's done for them, then... But the point here in this verse, verse 5, don't despise it when God chastens us. When He chastens you, He's doing it for your good. As it says there, you know, none of us like it. We don't like being chastened. You have a look there in, in verse number, uh, verse number seven. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? You know, we're not we're not get weary in that. We're not to try to avoid God correcting us. But if we have a mind surrendered to the Lord, that He is renewed, that He is renovated, uh, then it becomes fertile ground and, and we're going we're to flourish, we're going to grow. We're going to want God to, to, to correct us, to, to show us what's wrong for our good. And, and that, that's the thing. If your mind is, is renewed and you become that fertile ground for the Lord, you know it is. You realise He's doing it for the right reason. Point number three. It'll give us, if our mind is, is surrendered and uh, renewed and becomes his fertile ground, we'll have a burden, more of a burden, for the furtherance of God's work. Let me just uh, say this. Do you realise that if this work doesn't increase in ministry and outreach, we will decrease and cease? Do you realise that? And I can't, I can't put it into words that are sufficient, I feel, except just to say this. If it ever came to the day where we had to close the doors, uh, that's, the, that's probably the only time that, that people would realise what you've lost. Mm -hmm. You don't realise church is not just, oh yeah, I better go to church on Sunday. It is such a blessing and an opportunity to grow in your walk with your eternal Saviour that you're going to live with forever. 
it is an opportunity to tell others about the Saviour that died for them. It's not about just doing church. If that was all it was about, I wouldn't be standing here and waste my time. And I mean that with all my heart. Oh, here's confession time. Sometimes I think about the Philippines and I think about how easy it is out there to, to share the gospel with people in comparison to here. And I kind of go, I'm being honest. And when I get the chance to, to share the gospel with somebody, it's just, just a breath of fresh air. You know, I was downtown last night, as I do sometimes on a Saturday night, I duck downtown and get my offering out from the ATM because I, like I still like to put cash in the bag, you know. I know it goes straight back to the bank again, but nonetheless, it's okay. And down near the ATM that I go to, on a Saturday night, there seems to be the same two guys that, that go down there and they talk. And I can't repeat the conversation. Um, I don't want to turn the air black and blue. But, you know, I, I, I've seen them there a number of times, and so I, I went, Lord, should I, I you know, I, for some reason I felt a bit hmm, about, about giving them the gospel track. I had two more, put two in my pocket, one for each. And after I finished at the ATM, I went across to them and I sort of started to talk to them. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a you know, the piano downtown there. There's some kid on the belt in the way like this. And I just jokingly said to one of them, so that looks like the parents must have sent him down there to do, to practice his piano downtown because he plays so bad. And uh, it was pretty bad. It was pretty bad. And, uh, but you could tell he sort of had some, you know, at least a few lessons anyway. And so instead of, instead of going, oh yeah, ha, 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 this guy leaned and turned, turned to the kid who was over further and he yelled at the top of his voice in the middle of town with every four letter word that you could think of and told him to shut up. And I went, oh, I wish I hadn't said that. Anyway, I said, well, I'll just bear on for a little bit longer here and if you want me to give him a tract, you know, just turn the conversation around somehow. But the conversation just got went from bad to worse. Not, not, he wasn't yelling at me or anything. No, 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 no abuse. Just talking to me. He's an old, an older Aussie. Rough as, rough as anything. And the conversation, if, if you wanted to learn some new four-letter words, then that's probably the place to go to, to, to learn. And it was just every second word. And it was just like my spirit just went, oh. and it was just, it's the other Lord saying, just don't worry about it, just, let's just go. So I just said, see you guys, and off I went. You know, sometimes I do, I just I look at that and I think about the Philippines and I go, huh, ah, need a bit of a, bit of a, bit of a, you know, bit of a booster, not a vax. A booster. And so the thing is, it gives you a burden for the furtherance of God's work. It doesn't matter where you are. You, you, sit, you look at someone and you go, they look pretty rough, but they need the Lord too. The Lord went to the cross for, for, for them as well. And you know, when you read through Paul's epistles, you can see Paul's great burden for the work, it doesn't matter where it was. You know, he wrote what he wrote to the church in Corinth, the first epistle, because he didn't want it to be that way. He had a burden for the work that he, you know, that he laboured in for that year and a half or two years, whatever it was, and he was there. And, and he wanted he wanted them to, to, to prosper and to go forward in the work. He didn't want them to be where they were at. Uh, he wrote to the church in Thessalonica to encourage them to continue fighting a good fight of faith despite the persecution that they continue to, to, to experience. And, and you read through the different epistles that he wrote to them for different reasons. You know, the church in Galatia had got themselves back under the law and stuck under the law again, and he's trying to encourage them to, to go the right th direction. Why? Because he had a burden for the work. Let me ask you, Christian, how's your burden for the furtherance of God's work? Or is it just for well, the church? Has God renewed your mind? Have you surrendered your mind to God to renew your mind for it to be what He wants it to be? 
didn't just give us this church to come and feel warm and fuzzy. And, you know, King David was a man after God's own heart and he greatly desired for the worship of the Lord to progress, to go ahead. And uh, we know that God used him mightily to establish the kingdom and he got to the end of his days, or near the end of his days, and he said to prophet Nathan the prophet about, you know, he, he, he said, here I am dwelling in this house of cedars and the Lord's, the, the, you know, the, the tabernacle's there under the tent. It's in a tent. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 17, verses 1 to 12, David was about to move forward in, in, in starting to build a temple that was on his heart. It was a good thing. It was a good thing. Until, Nathan, until the Lord tells Nathan the prophet to tell David that, no, no, you're not going to do it, David, um, but your son Solomon will, or your son will. Now the point is, David had the right desire. He desired for the furtherance of God's work. He could see the need. And if you, have, if, if you don't have a mind for God's work, if, you don't, if God hasn't renewed your mind, if you, if you haven't got fertile ground for God to work on, you won't see the need. We all need to see that need. Every one of us, because we all have a part. You think about the early church in, in, in Acts chapter 2. Uh, they were all part of the work, progressing and going forward. So uh, Nathan, goes the, not, Nathan the prophet goes back to David and says, Well, David, God bless you. Now it's a wonderful desire, but the Lord has said, No, your son will build it. But did that stop David? No. It didn't disobey God. No, he didn't disobey God, but he, he prepared materials ready for it to be built. He was still mindful, like, okay, I can't build the, tab the, the temple, but I can still get some stuff ready to help build the temple. I, I can still help build the work of God. I can still help build the worship of God in this place. I can still help point the people towards worshipping the true Lord God of heaven and earth, even though he couldn't build the temple. But it takes fertile ground. That fertile ground will come when we have a renewed mind. And the renewed mind will come when we surrender that mind to God. Fourth, and it will bring a desire to be personally used of the Lord in seeing the, 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 the work here prosper. Now you might say, well, what's the difference between that and, and the previous point? There is a difference. Uh, let's go to Romans chapter 16. Romans 16. In Romans 16 we have, we see uh, Paul talking there in verses, uh, where are we, 3 and 4. Romans 16 verses 3 and 4 about Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, he's, he's writing to the church there in Rome, or the believers there in Rome. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila are back in Rome at that time. And Paul sends these greetings. Have a look at what he says here in verse 3 and 4. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who, for, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches uh, of the Gentiles. And so here is Priscilla and Aquila. They're indirectly helping the work of God by, by being what they were towards Paul. It, didn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't a matter of, it wasn't them directly doing, uh, this building a church or starting a church or whatever it might have been. But they were there, they were, they were there for Paul. Uh, we, we understand from, from what we can read that, that uh, at, at times Paul had to uh, help Priscilla and Aquila in their tent making business to, to support himself. See, God's got all kinds of ways to use us they're obviously very personally willing to, to, to help Paul in that way so he could prosper in the work that God had called him to. It wasn't about them. It was all about the work. It wasn't about having you know, a big, big name or anything else. They're just there quietly in the background in Romans, uh, sorry, Acts chapter 18 when Paul uh, had left them there in, uh, in Ephesus for a little bit while he went back to, to report to the church in Antioch and, and Jerusalem. Uh, about what the progress was in the work. Uh, in Acts chapter 18, they're still there in Ephesus and Paul eventually goes back there on the third trip to them. But while they were there by themselves, they're just there and they're, they're just going about life, but they're, but they're mindful of the work. 
along comes a fellow called Apollos, and he wasn't quite instructed properly in the Word of God, and so they take him aside, and, and uh, in verse number 26, you can read it later, in Acts chapter 18, they took uh, Apollos aside and instructed him a bit better in the work of God. So they said, okay, now you, we've taught you that, now off you go. And Apollos went on to minister. It wasn't about them. It was just a desire to be personally used of the Lord to see the work prosper. You know, God using, and God using other people. Point number five, and I'll just make these last couple you know, a little bit briefer. A mind that is God's fertile ground will help us to see others in a different light. It will produce a burden towards them that don't know the Lord Jesus as their Saviour. And let me just say this, it will also give you a different, a different view of other Christians too. When God has been able to work some things in your life to get you to be that fertile ground because you've surrendered your mind, He's renewed it, and he's let you go through some things, you're going to see other Christians in a different light too. Sometimes I think we, we are too quick to try to fit people into the box of our own knowledge of who we are and what we do and what we don't do. And I'm not saying it's therefore okay to do things that are wrong, but I'm just saying... You know, we're too quick to, to, to fit people into the framework of our little minds. Well, why are they like that? They shouldn't be like that because I'm not like that. Well, that's good for you. But you don't know what's going on in their life. And we ought not judge people. But as far as the unsaved go, it should give us a, produce a burden towards them who don't know the Lord Jesus. Because so were you in the past. And uh, they're going in verses, you know, Matthew 26, when the Lord's going to the, into the garden with his soul exceeding sorrowful, you know, even unto death. And then Hebrews 12, where the Father set before him the joy to endure the cross. And then Acts 26, uh, verses 26 and, uh, sorry, 27 to 29, uh, over there where Paul is, is before King Agrippa and he's giving his testimony before uh, he got shipped off to Rome because he appealed to Caesar. He said to King Agrippa, when Agrippa um, was, was listening to him, he said, King Agrippa, I believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except, bond, except these bonds. Paul had a great burden. It didn't matter who they were. Kings, Jews, Gentiles, rich, poor, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. And you know where he got that from? He got that from the Lord. The Lord's in the garden, souls exceeding sorrowful even unto death, and, and the Father sets before him uh, the joy to help him endure the cross, Hebrews 12, 2. Where the Lord could see all of those people, rich and poor, kings and, and, and so forth, coming to know him as Saviour. We need the fertile, fertile ground that God can use. Number six, a mind that is God's fertile ground will seek to help, sorry, will keep, will seek to keep the soil nourished by God's word. And uh, 1 Peter 2.2, 2, as newborn babes desire the milk of the word, uh, we should desire, we should yearn to, to soak in the word of God and, and to grow thereby. So that, that, so that that ground is, is well nourished and, and, and God can use it more and more for his purpose. And finally, from a mind that is God's fertile ground will spring from the depths of that soil the God-given gifts that have been there all along but could not spring forth earlier for lack of nourishment. Let me just close with this challenge. I wonder what gifts God has given you that can't spring forth because you haven't given in your mind. You haven't surrendered your mind. You haven't surrendered your life. He hasn't been able to renew it. And it may be as simple as the thing of, oh no, I can never do that. 
That's right, you can never do it. You, ne you No, you can't. That's right, exactly right. You can't, but God can. So just to close, let me say, your body may be the temple of the Holy Ghost, but your mind is the front door to that temple. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your grace, your mercy. Thank you for being able to think on these things today. Lord, uh, God, help us with the battleground that we have between our two ears, our mind. Lord, what a fierce battleground it is. And Lord, I just do pray, Father, that as we I go from here this afternoon, as we close today, and go from here this afternoon, may you lead and guide, may you help us to realise that we are in your hands, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth, and Lord, it's not up to us. It's about us, uh, Lord, giving you all of us so that you can mould and shape us to be what you want us to be. Father, I just pray for the working of the Holy Spirit of God in each and every one of our lives as we go and on through the week. And Lord, may uh, you get all of the honour and glory from our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, bless you in your afternoon.